Thank you, Mani, uh, and uh, thank you, everyone. Good morning. Uh, great to be here. I didn't know Joy, but all the information I gleaned during my research for this segment uh, tells me he was an uncommon man. And uh, I have the privilege here of uh, hosting Arvind Krishna, the chairman and CEO of IBM. Arvind is a PhD from University of Illinois in electrical engineering. He is an IIT Kanpur graduate. He also has many patents in his name uh, and also an editor of the IEEE and ACM journals. So a great STEM person here to have with me here this morning. Welcome, Arvin. Thank you. Thank you, Amar. But also thank you to everybody else for inviting me here. And this is indeed a joyful moment and we should treat it like that. So I know uh, that Joy worked at IBM uh, at Watson Research Labs for almost a decade. What are your memories of him? What did he contribute to IBM uh, from your perspective? It's a great question, MR. So many here, some know, but many do not know. So Joy and I joined IBM about the same time. I think he joined, if I remember, a few months uh, before I did. And you got to remember, many people here talked about his uh, entrance to the IITs, the JEE, and all that. You got to put that into context. People were usually pretty bright and pretty arrogant that they got in. And those who were in the first few hundred were pretty arrogant that they were that much better than the average. Then those who were in the top 10 were even more arrogant. So you can just imagine what being number one as more than a couple of people are here have remarked meant. From there, he went on to Stanford, which is hard. He then came into IBM with all of the reputation behind him. And you come in here, you know his name. I've known his name since my first year in college, by the way. It wasn't at IBM that I got to know his name. I knew his name for 10 years before I got here. And you're expecting to meet this really arrogant, really, I got no time for you person. And he was the exact opposite. That said, he was working in a group that really was solving some remarkable problems. Ramesh, uh, who was his housemate and a friend of his from IIT Madras talked about the memory compression. We should put that into context. People had talked about compression for a long time. It was felt to be computationally infeasible. It was felt to be, yeah, here's a theoretical idea, but you're never going to get it in with any um, pragmatic uh, nature into machines. And within a few years, Joy had proven that you can go do that using a mixture of old techniques, new techniques, his own clarity of thought, which is really what led to also the book that uh, got mentioned. How many people in the beginning of their graduate career get invited by the top three people on the planet? Come write a book with me. I think that speaks to Joy's uh, brilliant mind. And he could sort of cut through all the nonsense, go focus in on what was really critical and important, but then also expound it in a way that let's call it the average bright person could then take hold of it and do something with it. That legacy of his helping people around, because I remember you'd go down to the lunchroom, you'd be sitting there thinking about some tough problem, maybe an optimization, maybe on coding, maybe on something else. And Joy was always a resource you could turn to who would happily give you a hint, never demand credit, never anything else and move on. Um, lots of people also have talked about his uh, friendliness. I remember I came here as a grad student to IBM out of Illinois. And you come here and like, sure, you made the transition to Illinois. There you knew some people, you got to know others. You come now, you're restarting. And the three housemates, Joy, Raji, Ramesh, I remember how warm and welcoming they were, you know, on a cold winter night, come over for dinner. He's always uh, happy to have you there. And um, the conversation would flow sort of all the way from how you can help to sometimes into academia, sometimes around work. And those were great things. But the groups he worked with at IBM will always remember his contribution. I think it is so taken for granted now that we kind of forget it on how these techniques have really helped modern computation. And I know it sounds a little arrogant, but to think about it in green terms, if those memory compression techniques were not being deployed, we would need two to three times the total energy to run computing data centers. I think that's, people forget how much these areas of information theory are woven into the fabric of everything that we do. So, so MR, I'll pause there. 
but that gives you some sense of the human. Yeah, terrific, uh, Arvind. Uh, great perspective on what he contributed at IBM and, and his personality as well. But I want to focus on you a little bit to, because Joy stood for STEM and all the things around science and technology and engineering and math. Uh, so just take us through your personal journey. How did you as a young person get uh, interested in science and, and mathematics and what was your journey like? And walk us through how you got involved and, and got interested in this area. Well, it, it always goes through a step of maturation. So if I think back to, uh, to school days, you know, you go through all the subjects, you gotta go do everything. You gotta do languages, you gotta do history, geography, math and science. And it very quickly became apparent to me somewhere around grade 10 or 11 that the two things I loved the most were physics and math. And yeah, everything else was kind of tolerable, I'll say. And then you begin to think about it and say, okay, do I just, am I good at it? Or is there a passion for it? And somewhere around late high school, it became clear that there was a passion for doing that. I'm not sure about educating others at that point, but more about that's what I wanted to do. And as I thought about it, then engineering became as a desirable career. I had the fortune to get to IIT Kanpur. And there, I think um, a love for what it could do blossomed. And for me, it was much more about applying math into engineering, because I would sort of say a lot of engineering is applied math to some extent. And that really then took root. And as I got to graduate school and then probed deeper into the subjects and saw the connection really between all of this, that became an underlying passion. And I don't always say that everybody ought to do it at that level of intensity, but I believe that having a deep understanding of it is really, really helpful to everybody. And I strongly believe that we have the three R's that are taught in all high schools all over the world, reading, writing, arithmetic to some extent. I believe that the digital skills embodied in what kind of uh, joy did has to be the fourth one that everyone should learn. Not everyone needs to be a pra uh, practice those skills, but an understanding of them. The same way as not everybody's a great writer, but we should all know how to write. Every not everybody does math, but everybody kind of knows at least basic arithmetic because it's a life skill. And that then led to that. And if I look at the sheer shortage today, half a million cyber jobs in the US alone, probably somewhere around 10 to 15 million basic programming uh, skill jobs that are there, then trying to bring these skills to people, whether with high school education or with college, not, not necessarily engineering degrees, is becomes a passion of mine and one that we really, really want to push hard on as a corporation also. Yeah, that's terrific. And I know you grew up in a military family. Did that have any influence on, on, on your trajectory and your path? <laughs> I think the only influence or maybe more than one it had was twofold. One, um, movement uh, every few years was common. So maybe movement even across countries was a step, but not that big a step. Uh, the second thing it did was um, in the military, communication is actually key. People don't uh, always understand that. And so thinking about communication and then going from spoken to verbal to digital to analog and all those things uh, was, uh, was always intriguing. And uh, you always had this question, you bring together so many people into a typical base and suddenly you have 10,000 people who have never seen each other able to communicate, able to function and be a high performance team pretty quickly. Otherwise people would die. It was actually remarkable to watch. And as you think about it, I think there's lots of lessons on that for every organization to learn. Put the mission aside. I mean, we may agree or disagree with the mission, but the fact that you can bring so many people from different communities, languages, skills, and they can all function and reasonably like each other yeah. is actually... Uh, 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 something great to watch. Great. Uh, so moving on to uh, your, your personal uh, effort here in the U.S. and IBM as well. What is uh, what is what are you personally doing? What is IBM doing in terms of you know getting people excited, passionate, interested in in STEM and like all the jobs you talked about? Look, um, I, I know it sounds kind of cliched, but you've got to be part of the community. And at IBM, we have had the fortune to be part of our communities for 110 years. And as we think about it, every few decades, it's important to say, what does being part of the 
community mean? And we have taken uh, really two things to heart, not really hundreds. One, we firmly believe in skill building. Uh, we just made a commitment that we'll try and train 30 million people in STEM skills over this decade. So that's not a one or two year, but a decade long commitment. We also have a commitment to underserved and uh, underadvantaged communities, uh, mostly for high school, but maybe a bit more than high school through our PTEC program. And the third commitment we are making is for girls in STEM, and that is global, but is also very, very focused on India. So as I look at those three commitments, that and the intersection with the George Thomas Foundation, maybe it's serendipity, maybe there was a bigger influence that Joy had that none of us are quite willing to acknowledge. Maybe there's a shared heritage in there of uh, how we get there. But as we look at those three, there seems to me just a tremendous opportunity uh, to also partner. And I know our teams have been talking in the background about how we could uh, help amplify each other quite a bit. And of course, we are willing to help on the foundation also uh, directly, but I think that's a smaller part. But if we can help amplify what we are doing around the 30 million training with elements uh, on the Joy Thomas Foundation, because uh, the STEM education is a big piece there. Uh, the girls in STEM, if I remember our number right, I think we're at 180,000 uh, women uh, touched in India right now. We do that in conjunction with the American India Foundation. And if I look at the PTEC programs, we have about 200 schools uh, globally right now, uh, about half in the United States, uh, half outside. Um, all three of those are areas where we, we feel quite, quite with reasonable confidence that uh, we can work together. And I know that that's where we'll work together, not just with Sham, but with the whole foundation to see where we can amplify it. And look, IBM owes a word of thanks to Joy for what he did when he was here. He was always uh, such a great contributor and so humble, and he helped mentor so many people that uh, you'd be surprised, even 20 years after he's uh, left, how many people who were here during his time have such strong uh, and positive sentiment uh, towards Joy. And I know there's many others we haven't talked about. I know Rajiv Rao Swami is a great uh, um, uh, supporter of Joy, Anand Chingran, um, who was there on some of those photographs, is a great uh, supporter. There's so many of us, uh, both current and from, I'll call it the IBM diaspora, not just IED Madras, who are going to be great supporters of Joy. Great, and Arvind, uh, you talked about India a bit. I know IBM has a big presence in India with uh, you know, 100,000 plus, plus employees and such. Uh, how, how will this, uh, how would you be able to contribute to that effort there? Well, um, we actually, uh, we spend, as you know, um, many of us are committed to doing CSR, CSR efforts in India. We have put close to 100% of our efforts on, uh, on education and skills building. And so that's where it aligns immediately. Uh, we do a lot. I'll put aside uh, a mention that we're also going to focus on, I'll call it some advanced skill building through medical research, uh, conjoint with both ICMR, Indian Council for Medical Research, as well as IIT Kanpur. But putting those to the side, the bulk of our efforts, 90%, are very much aimed at skill building for high school and for college students. And within that, we have a focus on women. So that's where we think that there'll be a strong intersection. I let the foundation focus on giving the award to the best uh, um, uh, female IIT entrant. Uh, I think that is that that crowd, um, unless my memory serves me incorrectly, is well set for success later. But there's lots of others who need a bit of a helping hand. And I know others here are going to speak of that also. And we are going to focus our efforts there. Great. And in closing, uh, Arvind, uh, just a question. There's, you know, several hundred people on this call and watching it on different social media channels. How can the diaspora uh, and generally anyone watching this, uh, watching us at this point help with this cause? What would you have them do? Look, I think that one level at which one can help is always contributing either in kind or with uh, cash. Many of us are fortunate that we do have the ability to contribute, not everybody does, but those of us who can should. But let me put that to the side. The biggest issue always becomes scale. How do you scale something that it actually has a permanent impact and it has systemic impact? 
That means we need to get together and amplify each other's efforts and where possible, pick a few things to get done. That's where I would urge everyone, you know, pick the few. Uh, the Joy Thomas Foundation seems one that can scale and uh, let's leverage it uh, together. And so certainly give because that's important without resource, nobody can do anything. But the second one that is really critical, I think is the scale question. And so let's pick a few things and scale them. That will really be, uh, I think maybe the best uh, honor of uh, Joy's memory. So Arvind, thank you so much. You've been uh, so inspiring in, in talking about STEM, talking about your journey, IBM's contributions, and most importantly, what Joy has brought to the table here. So I want to thank you in closing uh, for this wonderful conversation and we'll keep in touch as to the future of the foundation and so forth. So thank you so much. And I want to now turn this back uh, to Manit. 